Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video and today I am delighted to be joined by Mr. Steve Whitty. Hi Steve. Hi James. Hi everyone. And today we're going to be looking at a band that I know that we're both big fans of, that band being Bebop Deluxe. We're going to be talking about the band, we're going to be talking about uh, the godlike genius that is Bill Nelson. We're going to be exploring some of the history of the group, looking at some of their uh, albums and their music and um, you know talking about why we like them. And then we're going to be urging you all to check them out if you haven't done already. Bill Nelson is a, is a guy from West Yorkshire. He was born in Wakefield and um, he went on to have this kind of interesting career in the 1970s. Where do, you, where do you fit into this story, Steve? Where did your first encounter with Bebop Deluxe actually happen? It would have been about the turn of the, about the 2010s. Um, on a Saturday night, I'd be listening to Planet Rock and Joe Elliott from Def Leppard. He has okay. a radio show he's very much a music fan and on that show he plays his record collection and it's a very extensive record collection from the 70s so it's not all heavy heavy metal through it i've learned about bands like dots and magnus and, and the like but one that stood out for me was bebop deluxe i think it may have been made in heaven i thought wow this is good i was aware of the name and i'd heard ships in the night uh, which was the nearest thing they had to a hit single yeah but um I, it, I was um, sort of astounded to think, well, I've not heard this. So I went on iTunes and, and brought myself, downloaded a copy of the Anthology, which was a double greatest hits album. When I started buying records again, when I could see their albums, I went out and bought them. I bought their records over a couple of years, you know, in charity shops. I mean, I totally missed them first time around. It's interesting because their career, I think, I think their last album was 1978, wasn't it? Yeah. Which would have been the first year that I started buying music, interestingly. So just as I came on the scene, they kind of, you know, departed the scene and I had no memories of them whatsoever on top of the pops or anything. But going back a few years now, I'm not sure how many years, it might be a fair few years, maybe sort of, you know, 10, 15 years. I came into the possession of this DVD. This is the Old Grey Whistle Test DVD, which collects together, you know, a fair few classic performances. And Bebop Deluxe are on this, and I remember watching them on this DVD and thinking, bloody hell, that's an interesting group. Just such a kind of sharp image and yeah. just this great kind of luxurious sound, you know, but I really didn't know anything about them at all. And um, when I started to pick up their records in charity shops, I mean, I don't know about you, but I found them all quite cheaply. They were not expensive records. Yeah, they were, they were easy to find cheap to find i suppose fortunately for the collector there isn't much of a back catalogue yeah but, uh, but um the, yeah price and there were plenty of them as well you know, considering the, the band didn't sell that many yeah exactly i mean they were not a huge band were they and i guess they still kind of fall under the radar at the moment of a group that you know people who are like really massively into music yeah. tend to know about them musicians tend to know about them because bill nelson was such an amazing guitar hero really wasn't he yeah and the guitar players will always know who he is but because they didn't sell that many records i mean they didn't do too badly and we'll, and we'll you know we'll We'll try and get into some of their chart positions, but clearly they're not kind of up there with your Zeppelins, your Queens, maybe not even on the same level as, say, I don't know, 10CC. You know, because uh, 10CC had a huge, you know, at least one massive mega hit, didn't they? Whereas Bebop Deluxe sort of only had maybe a, a, you know, a couple of minorish uh, hits, a couple of albums which maybe got into the top 20, but they never really became huge in America or anything. So they, no. they are a cult band, aren't they? Yeah, it's one of those secrets, and it's but it's it's some, some of that's worth uh, checking out because they are an amazing band. There, um, yeah. I mean, if we if we just get into a little bit of history, so this is the first Bebop Deluxe album, and it's called Acts of Victim. No doubt you've yep. got a copy to show there as well. Here we go, snap. This record came out in 1974. It didn't chart. Now there is a bit of prehistory to this because the story goes: Bill Nelson actually released a solo album. He came from Wakefield, which is this little place in West Yorkshire, quite near Leeds. And um, he did made a solo album. What was it called? The solo album, I Northern remember. Dream. Northern Dream. It was released on a sort of independent label, a local independent label. Yeah. So he sort of self financed it, I guess. And then what happened is it got played on John Peel, didn't it? Yeah. He sent a copy to John Peel. John Peel wrote a letter thanking Bill Nelson and advised him to listen to the show on us. I can't remember what date. Mm. And John Peel played the whole side one, and then told the audience he's going to play the whole of side two. Often did yeah. that, didn't he, back in he, the day? Wasn't he, it? It, it was a totally different time on the radio. Bill Nelson's bit of good fortune was there were several 
EMI executives who were listening to the same show, probably not to listen to Bill Nelson, but discovered him and that sort of piqued their interest in him. Yeah, and they pursued him, didn't they? EMI yeah. pursued him, but they very much wanted him as a solo artist. Yes. And he just formed Bebop Deluxe. It was a sort of classic bad timing. He'd formed this band, Bebop Deluxe, with his, I think they were just kind of mates who were on the circuit yeah. or on the scene in Wakefield. Robert Bryant on bass, Nicholas Chatterton Jew on drums, and um, I think a schoolhood friend, maybe Ian Parkin on guitar. Yeah, there was um, also a keyboarder originally called okay. Richard Brown, but he left pretty much just after the start. Bill Nelson felt really comfortable with the band. What EMI wanted him to do was come down to London and re-record um, his, his solo album with Session Men. But Bill Nelson said, no, I'm not going to do that. I've got my own van now. And I think he felt comfortable with the band. He felt comfortable the security having some mates with him. One of the guys on this album actually has a song, doesn't he? It's the song Rocket Cathedral uh, was written by Robert Bryan, the bass guitarist. So you could see this wasn't the direction that Bebop Deluxe was going to go in because they were going to turn into one of those great kind of auteur bands where you've essentially yeah. you've got this one singer-songwriter guy with all the vision, all the ideas, and the band are there just to facilitate. On the first album, there was clearly a slightly more democratic process going on. And I think probably you're right. I think Bill probably originally he had this idea that this is me and my mates and we're going to try and do something. But my understanding is what, what sort of changed was that they did a tour, they did a national tour with... Um, Cockney Rebel. That's correct, yeah. Bill Nelson um, started to, well, I mean, he was, you know, he'd watch them on stage every night and he could, he started to see what EMI meant because he'd watch Cockney yeah. Rebel and, you know, there were different calibre of musicians, I guess. So yeah, his EM, EMI were sort of like put, putting pressure on Bill Nelson to, you know, you need to ditch the band, you need to get better musicians in. Yeah. Um, not threatening you or anything, but they were sort of like dropping the subtle hint and Bill Nelson would go, no, no, everything's fine, all good. I know you're right, that Cockney Rebel tour, I think that's when the penny dropped, that he could, if he had better musicians, take the band to another level. Yeah, I mean, just before we get into that history, it's worth actually just, you know, quickly talking about this album and saying, I mean, what, what really strikes me about it, I don't know about you, is that, say all the other Bebop Deluxe albums had never existed and this was the only one, you wouldn't listen to it and go, oh yeah, this is a band, you know, they're not very good. I mean, it's, no. it's, it's not as impressive as the later ones. You can clearly hear that. But I mean, yeah. it's, still, it's still an amazing record. I mean, you've got incredible guitar playing still. Yeah, yeah you know, the other guys, they're good, but they're not outstanding. But Bill Nelson's um, songwriting and his vision, they do carry it through, don't they? It's still they a really, really impressive debut album. In a way, you could say the 70s are sort of wrapped up in a little bit in this album. Mm. You've got your glam, you've got your glam look. Yeah. There's hints of glam sound. There's hints of prog in there. Definitely. Uh, art rock. Art rock. Yeah, it's a whole, like, whole load. And I think, you know, you look at, so, say, tracks, Adventures in a, law, in a Yorkshire Landscape. Incredible. My particular favourite favor of this album. That, in a, in a short space, is a very prog. Prog album, a prog track. Yeah, the track Darkness has got yeah. um, orchestra and a choral yeah. section on it. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. the sound of the record to me, it sounds a bit like kind of early David Bowie, as in like the yeah. early Sconti years, you know, the man who sold the world. It's got that slightly strange kind of almost crepsular, dark kind of quality to it, sort of cult rock from the early 70s, English. It's art funny. Rock. It's Sorry, it's funny you mentioned Bowie there because that's where the initial comparisons were going in. Mm. Well, it's very Bowie-esque. Bowie and Bill Nelson sort of went, it, it riled him a little bit because mm. he, he never saw himself as a Bowie clown or get, being like Bowie or influenced by Bowie. Well, yeah, it rubbed him up the wrong way a little bit. Yeah. 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 He was his own, he thought, I think he was his own man. Yeah, I mean, he certainly got his own vision. I mean, one thing that struck me when I started listening to Bebop Deluxe, there, was, there were two things I thought about them that um, it took a while to click for me. The first thing was his voice. I, when I first got into them, I used to think, this, is an, this guy's an amazing songwriter and he's an incredible musician. But I wasn't too convinced by his voice for a long time. He's got this very kind of clear nice yeah. sounding English voice it, so it does it sounds like David Bowie a bit you know circa hunky dory man who sold the world it's very kind of English very precise sounding almost sort of angelic at times and my first thought was I can sort of see why this band was never huge because he's, he seems to lack a certain like oomph 
Yeah. You know, with the voice, he's, he's, he, you know, he's no Freddie Mercury. But gradually, I, I really started to fall in love with his voice. And yeah. I think you're right. It, it's, he's got his own sound. When you first hear it, you think, you know, you think David Bowie, but it, it, there's something else going on with his voice. It's beautiful enunciation and just this very clear tone which really offsets all that kind of, all the guitar work, which is so complex and you can really get your teeth into it. But then riding above it, you've got this voice, which is almost angelic. It's just beautiful to listen to, isn't it? It, it is, it is. It's uh, probably, it's another instrument. You know, you've, yeah. got, you've got this great guitar player, but then you've got the, the voice as well. And that voice is, you know, it's very underrated. He writes for himself. I think he's not writing for the group. He's writing for himself. We has the group to, to, to work the tunes round. And I guess, you know, falling into that, the other aspect of it was the lyrics. When I first started to read the lyrics from these records, my first immediate thought was a kind of mm, bit sort of pretentious because the lyrics are really florid and kind of dreamlike, aren't they? There's all strings yes. years, lots of dreamlike stuff going on. And if you were being a bit cynical about it, you'd think, yeah, this is just some guy scribbling nonsense on a napkin in his lunch hour and then going into the studio and singing it. But again, a bit like the vocal thing, the more you get into the music, the more you actually realise these lyrics are actually brilliant. There's a contradiction with Bill Nelson because musically his influence is Dwayne Eddy and The Shadows. Mm. That's what he grew up with when he started playing the guitar. Yet while he was at art college, he was a, became a big fan of Jean Cocteau. That's right, and, yeah. And that plays a big theme throughout his career. He went, when he set up his own record label, there's Cocteau. There's even a track called John Cocteau, which, which we'll come to when we look at the, the next album. So and that, that's what I suspect where his lyrical ideas are, come, come from. Yeah, like you said, we'll get into that as we get into the next record. So let's just now just really quickly then talk about this strange little patch of um, what you might call uh, instability in the lineup. So yeah. he has to basically, or he decides to get rid of these guys uh, that he formed the band with. He decides to do what EMI wanted him to do essentially. But then there's a weird little transition period where he gets in a couple of guys from Cockney Rebel, Paul yeah. Jeffries on bass and Milton Reen James on keyboards. He gets these guys in and, and it lasts six months or something or you know yeah. less than that so what was that all about what, what, what's your understanding of that what had happened with cockney rebel was all the band i think apart from Stuart elliott had gone to steve harley and basically said we want our stuff on on the record and steve harley said no and they basically said well we're off then and that is the inspiration for the song come up and see me make me smile that's right that another story or, or, or together. So they were at a loose end. So obviously teamed up with Bill Nelson. They'd obviously formed a, formed a, a, a friendship. With Milton Reams James, he brought over, I think it's uh, Simon, uh, the drummer? I'm Simon Fox. Fox. Yeah. yeah, he knew him. He brought him into the, into the band. And of course, and he was going to survive, wasn't he? He was going to yeah. be the, you know, the drummer of the band. Yeah, it just didn't work out. Personalities, uh, maybe they could see the same situation they had with Steve Harley, you yeah. know, but, Bill Nelson wanting to control, be the main songwriter, and maybe yeah. that's what's caused the um, the fallout. But they did manage to record one one track. They did the uh, a version of Between the Worlds, which was a song which was going to be on the second album. Yeah, there was a version of it cut with the guys from Cockney Rebel, um, but then that lineup didn't actually manage to get yeah stable. So then what happens is he then, like you said, he kept he kept Simon Fox, who was the drummer. But he got rid of the other two guys and then he brings in this, well, he auditions some bass players and this guy walks into the, into the rehearsal room, Charlie Tumahai, who is this yeah. extraordinary kind of Afro moustache sporting New Zealander. Yeah. Looks like Jimi Hendrix. He's got this big infectious grin on his face, which just never seems to go away. It's just always there, you know. He came into the rehearsal room and just played amazing sort of fluid bass guitar and he seemed to like immediately... Um, tune in to what Bill Nelson was doing and Simon Fox yeah. had already done that so all of a sudden it was like wow right okay this is the lineup and then you've got this incredible looking band there I'll just quickly show the show the picture yeah um, one of the most photogenic kind of yeah. groups of the 1970s I'd say there's Bill they're looking so sort of I don't know angelic it's like, like a quiff there isn't it it's not... <laughs> yeah this is um, this is Simon Fox the drummer and then here's yeah. Charlie and um, it's not going to be the, the absolute definitive lineup because they're going to get another person in, which we'll talk about in a minute. But this is the lineup that goes to the studio. They go to uh, Rockfield, which is the studio where Queen 
did Night yeah. at the Opera. And they work with Roy Thomas Baker, the Queen producer. That was a fraught relationship. Bill Nelson clashed with Roy Thomas Baker at, at, at times during the recording of the album. Bill Nelson was playing guitar and keyboards on the album. There's one thing about Bill Nelson, and we've talked about having one in, we'll say, control. Mm -hmm. And I think he found that with working with Roy Thomas Baker, Roy Thomas Baker wanted control. Whether he wanted to turn Bebop Deluxe into another queen, I don't know, because I don't, when you're listening to this, and these are my cassette copy of, of said album, yeah, um, it does actually sound anything like Queen, to be, to be honest. So, uh, mm. uh, that, uh, you know, it's, it, I suppose Roy Thomas Baker was at the assistance of the record company. Well, the story that Bill Nelson tells, essentially, I mean, there's one thing that you've got to understand about Bill Nelson, I think, when you get into Bebop Deluxe, is that he was such an intense guy. He was... Yeah. He had this vision that I think was formed quite early on. It's like this, it's almost like he dreamt the sound of Bebop Deluxe almost from the yeah. start. And he was very intense. I think particularly after Act of Victim, which even though it's a good album, he, you know, he didn't have the musicians that he'd exactly wanted. Now he's got this great lineup. And I think the quote was, he said he wanted to make a genuinely astonishing album. He wanted to make something which was truly going to just knock people's socks off. And <laughs> Roy Thomas Baker, for whatever reason, I think he was a bit cocky. He kind of done the queen thing and he was like the man of the moment. Yeah. And he would just constantly play practical jokes in the studio. Like according to Bill, uh, Roy Thomas Baker at one day, <laughs> I don't know why he did it. He set the mixing desk on fire one day just to freak Bill out. I, I, God knows how it actually managed to happen or how they put it out or anything. And he'd do things like, you know, Bill would be trying to get like a level in his cans and Roy Thomas Baker would whack everything up on the desk and you know, blow, his, blow his ears out. And one day Bill Nelson just basically freaked out you know, in the studio yeah. and said, I don't care who you are, I don't care who you produce, but you're not gonna fuck up my album kind of thing. And it immediately, you know, Roy Thomas Baker immediately went back to being, you know, kind of uh, a bit more professional. But then kind of later in the day, he turned around to Bill Nelson and said, well, you know, that was, you know, that was a bit kind of, prima donna kind of attitude and Bill said well you know I'm sorry but I, I'm serious here I actually want to make a fantastic album and I, I don't really want to be japing around in the studio and I love that story because it just demonstrates just how serious this young guy was you know yeah he, he knew what he wanted yeah he knew what he wanted I mean it's uh and I think when you come to listen to the album you know it's a really it's a it's definite improvement on Axe Victim yeah um so you've got some great songs on here um, well, Sister Seagull, an absolute staple. I was listening to that this morning, uh, just through a pair of earphones, and it's just like, you know, just the crashing the guitar. You know, it's just absolutely wonderful. And then you have Made in Heaven, mm. which ended up becoming a surprise hit single for them. It was a sort of middling hit, I think, wasn't it? Well, what happened in 1975, EMI released what's called the Hot Vowels um, EP, basically songs from all the albums. So you had Made in Heaven from Futurama. That was the lead track. Bring Back the Spark from Modern Music. Blazing Apostle from Sunburst Finish. And Jet Silver and the Dolls of Venus from Axe Victim. Okay. But it ended up hitting the top 40. And lo and behold, Pan's people are so adapting <laughs> to Made in Heaven. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's a short song, isn't it? It's only about it's two and a half minutes long. But, six, but it's, a, it's a statement of intent. It's just, show, it's just um, yeah. that opening and then Bill Nelson with his lead guitar break and then into the chorus. And then it just goes at the end, you know, just sings his bit and that's it. I mean, we should, talk, we should talk about Bill Nelson's guitar at this point, because one of the things that startled me, really, about Bebop Deluxe was this gradual realisation. You know, when you buy records, you, you, yeah. you, you can sort of you know, listen to music all the time, and these things creep up on you sometimes. And I do remember, you know, listening to, I think it was probably Sunburst Finish, which we'll get to in a minute, but it's you know, equally true of the music on Futurama. Just this gradual thing where you think, I'm listening to a really, a really good guitarist here, like a really excellent yeah. guitar player. And then you start to thinking, actually, I'm listening to a truly, truly fantastic guitar player. Yeah. I mean, it's you're talking like, that. just like, well, you know, in terms of pop rock, and it's going to sound a bit like hyperbole, I, I genuinely can't think of anybody better than him. I don't know about you. I mean, no, no. I, just I, the I, expressiveness I, of the instrument in his hands it, it is quite amazing. 
And I think it, that, that gets lost, possibly because Bebop Deluxe wasn't that big. That yeah. how great a mu musician he, um, Bill Nelson is. He doesn't get listed as a chief influence. Mm. I don't see people going, or oh, big influence on me, Bill Nelson. Mm. You know, they'll go on, oh, Clapton, Beck. Yeah. There's all that sort of like that mythology about those, those guitar guitarists. But then you listen to that, uh, Bill Nelson, I think he could be ranked up there with, with them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the thing is, he speaks through his guitar, doesn't he? His, yeah. his, his solos are so emotional. Yeah. But the thing is, it's really strange because they're quite precise. They're almost not, not, not mathematical, but there's such precision. Like, you know, when he plays a run, it's like yeah. it's beautifully done. And sometimes, um, you know, guitar players like that or keyboard players like that, it's too precise. It's too sort yeah. of, you know, this, this guy's a bit clinical. There's nothing like that at all because he somehow manages to imbue it with all this kind of emotional thing. And he does it with such panache and fluidity and it's sort of mercurial and almost sort of heavenly at times. These great sort of yeah. cascading, well, almost like a firework display, just like, bloody hell, this is really, really amazing guitar playing. It is, it is really top-notch guitar playing. It is, yeah. and the fact is, when he got the band together of like-minded musicians, that just elevated him up to an, to another level. It sort of pushed him. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think if he stuck with the same lineup that done Axvict him, we probably wouldn't be talking about Bill Nelson in, in the same in, this, in, in, in the same way. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Simon Fox's drumming, it, it sort of does remind. I mean, I mean, it's interesting that you say it doesn't sound like Queen. I think there is a parallel a bit between Bebop Deluxe and Queen. If you think about Brian May's guitar, again, he's got that yeah. thing which is very technical and very precise, but I think Bill Nelson is, is more emotional and touches the heart more, I think, than Brian May does. Um, but I think Simon Fox is he's quite similar to Roger Taylor. He, he, yeah. He's not flashy, but he's very kind of stylish and everything he does is just sounds beautiful and really helps to glue the songs together because these yeah. songs are not, they're not kind of straightforward songs, are they? They're like little mini symphonies. They're kind of like all sorts of movements and different themes coming in and out. Yeah. Really complicated music. And what's really amazing, we should just say, is that Bill Nelson wrote all the songs for this record on a little, little crappy upright piano that he managed to find. I think his local church hall had given it to him. And he sat in his little living room in Wakefield, wrote all these songs on this piano. And he worked everything out like, you know, there's one yeah. track, isn't there, which is it... Um, Music in Dreamland has got um, it's got a brass band on it, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And he worked out all the parts that the brass band were going to play on this crappy old piano and went into the studio and said, right, this is what the brass band is doing, you know. And this guy, he had no musical training at all. He couldn't write music, couldn't read music. And just, just what, what an imagination. And that, that, put, that was put, you know, put down because his, his father was a semi-professional saxophonist. That's right, yeah. Um, I tried to teach um, Bill the saxophone. Bill couldn't pick it up. He couldn't read music. It was only because his brother, elder brother, or I think his brother, had a toy guitar flying, flying around. He picked up the guitar and found that he got a natural thing with ability with the guitar instrument. Essentially, what happens is he makes this album, Future Armor, and he thinks it's going to, well, I think he's got great ambitions for it, but it doesn't sell. It doesn't chart. No. No. So uh, he decides that he wants, on the third album, he wants to be the producer now. He didn't have this very good experience with Roy Thomas Baker. He now wants to produce, but EMI are a little bit uncertain about letting him do that. So they're making this counter offer. What if you were to co-produce and we'll get somebody experienced in? So for Sunburst Finish, he teams up with John Leckie, yeah. who had done a bit of work on Axe Victim. I think he'd done a bit of mixing or something. So they'd met each other. They kind of knew each other. They're going to do some burst finish, which is the third album. This is the one that people will know. It's the one that started yeah. to gain some traction. And, yeah. he, and on this record, he has this really, really positive experience working with John Leckie. And they yeah. just get hand in glove and they become this great team, which then stay together for at least six, seven, eight records. John Leckie is, is, is no slouch. He, he yeah. was a staffer. A, a staff me uh, member of e at EMI, and he first started as a tape op. So, if I give you an uh, example of, of three albums that he was a tape op on, yep. All Things Pass, right? John Lennon's Plastic Ono Band album, Barrett. Right. So, that's three albums he was tape op on. Then he became a balance engineer, and the albums he was worked on, Medal, Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd, Mott, Red Rose Speedway. 
So we're not talking about someone that didn't know didn't know what he was doing. So he was EMI felt he was ready to become a producer, and that's why they they, they offered him to Bill Nelson. Bill Nelson really didn't know how to wouldn't know how to work the board. Yeah. John Leckie could do that, but they could learn off each other, bounce off each other. Yeah, Bill Nelson tells this really nice story. He said he sat down, because this album was recorded at Abbey Road, wasn't it, for a start? Yeah. So, so Bill Nelson sits down in front of this massive desk. I don't know how many channels it had, like you know, 10,000 channels. And he just, he sat down next to John Leckie and just said, well, bloody hell, John, how on earth do you know what to do with this? And John yeah. Leckie just turned to him and said, well, Bill, the trick is you just twiddle the knobs until it sounds good. And Bill Nelson was like, really? Well, that's it. And he went, yeah, essentially, just twiddle the knobs until it sounds good. And that was the advice that he gave to Bill Nelson. And Bill Nelson said that that sort of carried him through them for the rest of his career. It was like, okay, well, that sounds doable. They're now a four-piece. Here he is here, Andrew Clark. He comes in on keyboards, doesn't he? He, he, he played on the tour, which uh, promoted Futurama. And so the, the classic lineup is there, the complete lineup. And it's, this is the album where Bill Nelson decides, I'm going to try and write a, hit, a single EMI were pushing him to do, to a single and Ships in the Night which is the first track on the album yeah. was the attempt to be the hit single again it just reached hit, hit the top 30 I think it didn't make that great shakes I mean Bill Nelson describes it as a bit of an albatross because yeah. if anyone plays any bebop deluxe on the radio it's, it's, not, that, it's yeah. that song and he wrote it, I think he sort of wrote it deliberately almost, like let's, let's try and write a slightly cheesy by numbers yeah. kind of pop song. And it worked, it was a hit. And obviously because of the hit, that made people buy the album. So really, even though he doesn't like the song, he has to sort of grudgingly admit, okay, this was the track that set me up. So yeah, he does acknowledge the fact that he did open a few doors for the band. You know, the tracks on this record, you know, whatever it is, you know, the deep cuts, they're so incredible. I mean, Crying to the Sky, I've mentioned already, beautiful, majestic song, Sleep That Burns, Heavenly Homes, fantastic, Life in the Air Age, Crystal Gazing, just very, very strong. I would say this represents their creative peak. This is just a, a wonderful album. Yeah. And it also completes... Probably an accidental trilogy of guitar themed titles. Actually, yeah. And then got the the guitar. The second album, I will show you my vinyl copy, Futurama. Apparently, it's an Italian model uh, guitar, cheap model guitar, which Bill Nelson remembered in the time. That's why it called, called the album that. Well, he said it was the guitar that you had to buy in the, in the late 50s. Nobody yeah. could get a Stratocaster because they just were not in this country. They didn't get imported here until the sort of, you know, after Hank Marvin came on the scene. That's when you could buy a Stratocaster. But the, but the Futurama was a sort of cheap imitation of it, wasn't yeah. it? Sunburst Finish is the finish of his main guitar, which his dad bought, which is a 19, in 1964. It's a Gibson ES345. So if you see some of the old... Um, video clips of bebop looks that's the instrument that um, bill nelson is playing he still has the guitar it's um, i mean that he's had that guitar longer than i've been on this earth so yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, he actually he actually now owns this guitar again this guitar which is on the back of um Andy yeah Green. really sweet story attached to this one it was bought by somebody i can't remember who it was now and bill nelson ended up working with this person and the person tried to give him the guitar back because he said you know bill this is your guitar. This is, this is the guitar that's on the back of Axe Victim. And Bill said, no, 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 you bought it. You know, you should have it. Now, this person, whoever it was, I can't remember, then went on to sell the guitar. And then years later, it appeared on um, eBay or something. Yeah. And Bill Nelson's fans all clubbed together and bought it for him. So oh. they opened the guitar back and they presented it to him, and it, you know, in this, little, in this little ceremony. So Bill Nelson now... Owns the, guitar. owns the guitar again, which was on the back of Axe Victim. That's sweet. That is sweet. Yeah, so I should just say, I mean, just a bit of trivia, really. Um, yeah. Some of the tracks on Futurama and some of the tracks on Sunburst Finish, lyrically, again, you know, going back to this idea that this kind of dreamlike complex lyrics, which seem, yeah. on first reading, they seem a bit sort of pretentious, but in fact, they're absolutely brilliant. But it turns out that Bill was going through a divorce around about the time of Futurama going into Sunburst Finish. He was divorcing from his first wife, and a lot of the songs are the kind of metaphorical songs about the breakup of his marriage. Um, the song Crying to the Sky in particular is about yeah. that. And if you listen to the song, 
you know, knowing that it, it really makes it very moving because again, it has this incredible guitar solo, a really kind of cathartic, blazing, emotional kind of guitar. So I thought that was quite interesting. The fact that on the surface, these songs, they seem a bit outlandish and a bit kind of like, you know, airy fairy, but they're not really. Now you peel away, peel away yeah. the then you find that there's a deep emotional meaning to the songs. Yeah. Yeah. So after some bus finish, they tour America. They go to America and yeah. they do pretty well. Um, I think one of the things that Bill is most proud of, because he, he, you know, he talks about this and he, you know, he kind of shows a photograph. But they were supported by Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers uh, in the states. And there's a there's a famous shot of a theatre somewhere in America, and it says Bebop Deluxe on the top, and then underneath in smaller letters it says Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers who I imagine would have been at yeah. the start of their career at this point. It would have been in you know, 1975. But even so, I think that kind of shows that they did, yeah. they did make some inroads. So they go to America and tour a lot. And they, Bill starts to get into this cycle now. It starts to happen. You know, the, the album yeah. tour, album yeah. tour thing starts to happen. Uh, with touring America, you have that hour on stage, but it's a lot of traveling, yeah. you know, moving uh, cities doing the pro, pro, promos, uh, promotion at the radio stations. It did become a bit of a grind. And he sort of starts to write about it on the band's um, fourth album. On side two of this record, there's a little suite of songs in there, which essentially, yeah. I mean, you can sort of see from the song titles, Lost in the Neon World, you know, Down on the Terminal Street. He starts writing about the pressures now. And, and the, um, the, the Uncle, Uncle Sam humanoids. That's know. right, yeah, yeah. Actually, I should just say, I completely forgot to mention the chart placing. Even though Future Armour and Axe Victim didn't chart, Sunburst Finish got to number 17 uh, in the charts. Now, Modern Music, which came out the same year, actually came out in 1976, got to number 12. So on the back of all that American touring, he comes back to the UK and he's, and he, and he, you know, yeah. this is a proper hit album. Yeah, I think Bill Nelson, and was, when I was reading up about it, was so in love with America as a kid. Yeah. And, you know, you're going up in 50s, uh, 50s Britain, and you compare that to 50s America, it's chalky cheese. Yeah. Uh, get, got all the TV programmes. He described it as being a sort of alien world, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. It was totally different. You know, the old imagery, he fell in love with it. And then he gets over there. And while it was exciting at first... As we mentioned about the, the, the drudgery of touring and all the travelling, it started to wear him down and it sort of affect, affected his view a little bit of, of the place. And it's heavily influenced, as you said, on the second side of this album. Still a great record, though. It's still it's got great playing, great. great songs. You don't really hear a band in decline. I mean, it's only the fourth album, you know, at the end of the day. I mean, you know, we now know that, that they didn't survive beyond the fifth album, but... You know, most bands sort of get into their stride on the third or the fourth album, and you can sort of hear that. I mean, okay, you might say maybe it's not quite up there with some verse finish, but it's definitely not a disappointment. It's still no. got all bebop no. looks magic to it, hasn't it? It's still a very good. It's still a very good album. You know, the band are on a roll, but I think the whole thing had started to grate a little bit with Bill Nelson. I think he was the one thing I've always noticed that as soon as he finished the project, even if he was touring his mind was on the next thing yeah and whether he at this point he's starting to feel that he'd got as far as he could with bebop deluxe yeah uh, he has said that he'd intended to make it the last album yeah he decided after the record came out i think he decided that should be the last record really but when he told emi that of course they were aghast because bebop deluxe were at that classic juncture where they were starting to make inroads in America and what a record company does not want to hear from an artist who's about to crack America or is on that ascent is um, oh yeah I want to disband and just get just do something else you know and they essentially EMI sort of you know put pressure on him to keep the band together for one more record there was a kind of yeah. deal that they had with him a sort of unspoken agreement make us one more Bebop Deluxe album and then we'll finance whatever you want to do after that. They released the live album, which is named after a track off Sunburst Finish. I've also managed to find a copy of the set of the EP as a seven inch, so there are various combinations. Yeah, uh, good stuff. And yeah, so I guess that was documenting the American tour, was it or? It was, yeah. Right, yeah. right, okay. It's, yeah. A, it's sort of like, you know, the band were on the roll, let's cash in. Yeah. Um, Bill Nelson, he was rather well, taken aback when he was told this was the biggest selling album because his mind was focusing on the next project, on the next album. Yeah, so it got to 
Modern Music now got to number 12, so it was a top. It was nearly a top 10 album. Yeah. Um, so like I said, EMI were definitely not happy, I don't think, when he said, I want to I s- split the band. And I would, you know, I would imagine that Charlie Tumahai and Simon Fox and Andrew Clark were a bit, a bit gutted yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, you know, I think we've talked about this already, the fact that Bebop Deluxe were an auteur band, weren't they? I mean, Bill, yeah. Bill, Bill Nelson used to make demos of the songs and he, he claimed that these demos were pretty much what was the eventual um, version on the record was really close. Yeah. He would let the musicians express themselves, but essentially he said his main purpose in the studio was trying to get the music to sound as close as he could to the demo version. So that, that, that kind of gives you a sense of how, the, how not really a band in the sense of, you know, the Stones or Led Zeppelin, much more a thing where you've got just one guy with all the ideas and, and you know, the, the, yeah. the group members are there to facilitate that. So when it became clear to him that actually I want to do something else now, obviously it was all, you know, I mean, the bull was in his court. That's what was going to happen. Yeah, and that's, and that's kind of why that was that was it. It just you know it just ended up being his final statement. But how would you characterize the music on this record? Because it there are some parts of it which are similar to previous records, but there's stuff which is different as well. Yeah, this is edging towards a new uh, direction. He yeah, started listening to punk new wave and yeah. was influenced by it. You can tell some of the songs. There's that edgier version, and it's sort of like what would lead on to Red Noise. Um, yeah, he was a fan of Wire, wasn't he, in particular, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, who, who happened to be on the same label. Uh, Harvest. On, on Harvest, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At, the same, at, that, t- at that particular time. And yeah, I, think, I mean, the song Electrical Language, which is the first yeah. lead-off track, um, I think Bill said at the time, people didn't realise that there's more guitar on this record than people thought because he was playing yeah. a guitar synthesizer. Yeah. So lots of the stuff that you hear on the record, you assume it's keyboards, whereas in fact, in classic Bill Nelson genius, you know, guitar god yep. style, he's playing all these keyboard parts on a on a guitar. And um, electrical language is just—I think it's one of the great. I assume it was a single. Was it a single? It was. It was. I think I have got a said single. Yeah, just one of the great singles. There you go. Eight. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's just got a great sound to it. It's almost maybe a little bit of kraut rock coming through or yes there's so much influences uh i think in bill nelson can be described as a bit of a sponge when it came to different mm. music musical influences he were he certainly picked up on a lot of things i imagine they've been listening to a fair bit of kraut rock mm. um and the new wave and that sort of sort of influence as i said he, he was always thinking a hip head the, yeah. the seeds of this album would have been when he was t- uh, touring modern music. The seeds of what he wanted this album to be, be like was already in his mind. Yeah, yeah. And I guess you've got to sort of hand it to him. It's one of those great, great, you know, great stories. I always love these stories because, you know, most of us, most of us lesser mortals, we kind of dream of this life where you're in this yeah. successful band that's got a name and you're able to go to the States and play big tours and, you, you know, your albums... I started to get into the top 20 and, yeah. you put your, and you put yourself into that position and you just think, God, if it was me, I would just milk it. I would just carry on. I would take yeah. that name and I would make a career out of it. Just like Pink Floyd did, Status Quo, all these yeah. bands that never knew when to stop, you know. Whereas someone like Bill Nelson, he's the opposite. He's the ultimate creative individual. He's, he's not thinking about chart placings and he's not thinking about adoring fans or signing yeah. autographs. He's literally thinking, what's my next creative move going to be? Yeah. And if in his mind that does not involve playing with these musicians and being in Bebop Deluxe, it doesn't matter what EMI say to him or how much money they offer him, he's going to just go off and just break up the band essentially and just stop. You know, it's amazing really. On the Bill Nelson YouTube channel, there yeah. is an interesting video. This was recorded in France and Bill Nelson had got himself a cine camera. So he's filming a lot of what was going on there. Not so much the actual recording process, but the, 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 what the, living the lives down there. And I think Bill Wyman turned up um, in, in the video. So it's worth checking out Bill Nelson's um, YouTube channel. Bill, Bill Wyman and Bill Nelson. <laughs> it was a strange yeah, combination, the, isn't it? Two Bills. I think, I can't remember if Bill Wyman had something to do with the, with the studio. Just sweet and rock star, of course. Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it's quite, it's quite, quite, quite. I think the whole process of recording the album, you know, I mean, the one thing we say when the band split up, we wouldn't 
split up because they fell out. It was just no. that Bill, Bill Nelson wanted to move on. So, I mean, that essentially concludes the Bebop Deluxe story, but it does not conclude the Bill Nelson story. I mean, you've got the Red Noise record there, haven't you? I do have it, but I just didn't pull it off the shelf. So his next project goes even further down into this sort of post-punk, short, angular songs, lots of abrasive textures. You, yeah. you sort of lose that beauty and that kind of elegiac quality that did characterize yeah. the bebop records, and you, and you start moving into a harder, bleaker kind of sound now, don't you? You know what, he wanted to kill bebop that looks stone dead, and this is the direction I'm going, into, going in now. Yeah. Um, he also started getting uh, outside production um, gigs as well. He was producing skids. He, he co him and John Leckie co-produced um, Days in Europa. Yeah, he also produced Gary Newman as well, didn't he? Yeah. Although, I think they fell out in the end and Newman ended up um, remixing the record and they fell out. But I mean, Bill, I think Bill Nelson has done a lot of production work over the yeah. years. I mean, I don't have a complete list of what he's done, but I think in the 80s particularly, because obviously his days as a kind of semi-major rock star essentially were completely finished, weren't they? And yeah. he turned into what is, what I guess you'd call a cult artist. I mean, I still find Bill Nelson records every now and then. And there's a few in the 80s, which are definitely the sort of electronic, experimental, non-vocal, you know, I mean, you can tell he's moved into an area now. I think he always said that he, that he made enough money out of Sunburst Finish, essentially, that it was able to, well, not just money, but he, he gained enough profile and enough... Yeah career traction that he was able to, to then spend the next 40 years doing what he wanted essentially yeah, yeah. Um, he set up cocktail records um, right. yeah. not, not to job i mean this but this is a reissue that's on cocktail records it's not an original harvest because what happened was when R red noise was starting to do a second album emi got taken over by fawn and they were known as fawny and not emi and basically acts like red noise wire yeah wire lost their deal as well didn't they yeah. the deal basically as bill nelson said the sort of the, the businessmen have started taking over the record company that's right yeah 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 so i mean just to bring the story up to date you know if anybody's interested in bebop deluxe well i mean obviously i mean you know the first thing to do is to go back and buy the five records that bebop deluxe did that's your kind of starting point but bill nelson to my knowledge he's i mean his health is not that great he's you no. know He's diabetic now, I think, and um, I heard a story, a, a bit of a distressing story, that he's losing his eyesight as well. So, but he is still active. He's got his own website, which I'll link to down below, and he's still making music. He makes music. I think he uses Bandcamp now, and he does music which you can buy as downloads. I th but I think he does do some CD stuff as well. So he, he's still definitely a kind of active force in music, isn't he? And uh, yes, he is. And I've mentioned about his YouTube channel and there's one particular YouTube video he made where he gets images from all, from his life, from his birth to present day. So you're talking about 70 odd years of photos blended in with, with like he pro 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 provides the backing. Yeah, I've seen that. It's, it's an absolutely wonderful piece. You know, it's just yeah. uh, it's a very moving piece, actually. Yeah, yeah to yeah. watch. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, Bill Nelson, I think, is an absolute genius. I think it's a shame in a way that he never gained the profile of, you know, whatever, like a David Bowie or something. I mean, I don't think he was ever going to do that because I just don't think he was into being a star. He didn't want to be a pop star. All right, Steve. Well, that was that was wonderful. Thank you for joining me for that little excursion. My pleasure. Thanks for watching, folks. We'll see you all soon. See you later. Bye.